PC, accounting for your future. Here we are, here's a P7 session two of your tutorials online, which is about ethics. What we're going to do in this is we're going to have a little bit of revision about ethics to start off with. Uh, just a 15 minutes or so to remind you of the main bits of ethics anyway. We're then going to have a look at uh, approach to ethical questions, the overview of what you're supposed to do to get maximise your marks and the time answering these questions. And then we've got two questions to go through, one for the APC pack and one for the December 13 examination, which is question four, to give examples of how ethics are actually examined in P7 and how to get uh, points for the, for the answers out of the questions of the examiner sets. To start off with, what you need to know about ethics is partly way back from your F8 knowledge and will also have been, of course, in your uh, P1 exam, you may recall from the depths of time. In that both those exams, the ethical principles were examined and the five main principles are again here, of the integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, competence and due care, and also courteous consideration, how to behave. So integrity means that uh, people should be able to trust accountants because you tell the truth and uh, try and be helpful and so on. Objectivity, there's nothing there to, to say that you're not, uh, you're not objective. In other words, you haven't uh, prepared something yourself, which means you won't be able to review it because you won't see your own mistakes. There'll be lack of objectivity there. You have a subjective view. Uh, we do keep client information confidential. And we make sure, therefore, that it doesn't go to any other party apart from the client. Uh, we do <coughs> work with a competence and due care. So basically, we've always got the skills and knowledge to do the job. And we hopefully behave with courtesy and consideration at all times. So people get happy with uh, accountants and how they perform and so on. There are various key areas with ethics that we perhaps ought to go through just to remind ourselves of potential problems in this area. Just jump down the screen a little bit too far there. There we are. Uh, so here's some of the areas just to remind you again where ethics might actually be needed or might actually be examined within P7. Uh, the first one there is just undue dependence on audit clients. So you're getting too much income effective on audit clients. That does give a, a threat to independence. And also because of self-interest threat, if you can remember that's a, the five sort of threats there as well. And the main thing to watch out for is the 15% rule, 15 to a listed company for two successive years. You don't actually, you can't exceed that or shouldn't exceed that. Again, that rule does change relatively frequently, so just make sure it's correct before we get to June. Not sure whether the right one for the time being, though. There are also family and other personal relationships, which could impair your independence again, because you might be tempted to actually keep your family or friends happy rather than do a good audit. So the basic rule is there not to have family or other connections working as a client or placing undue influence on the results of the audit. Uh, and those <coughs> connections would normally be spouse and minor children and other companies you might be related to having interest in that particular client because you'd actually again want to make sure that client had a, a higher profits perhaps those other companies also then received high dividends for example so those things are barred your spouse or minor children certainly can't work for a client and you certainly shouldn't have a, any relationship with a company that's got more than 20% of the shares of the client. Again, you're, you're deemed to be connected. Same connection with another, another practice will be a partner, director or shareholder. So if you've got a, if you're a common partners or directors or shareholders, again, you shouldn't be involved in those sort of companies. Uh, you may actually have beneficial interests in shares or other investments. And the basic rule is there, you can't audit a company or a partner or connection with a beneficial interest in the audit clients. So that all the partners in the audit firm can't have the interest. Technically, audit staff could, it's not going to be involved in the audit. But you find most of the time now, uh, audit firms would ensure that all staff also do not have some form of shares or other interest in a client, because it does show independence. Otherwise, again, you would expect the, the hope of the company to make a profit, and obviously the more profit you make, then the more in dividends you get from your shares. So there's the threat. 
So you remove the threat by not having the shares. There's also the issue of loans. Okay, uh, Don't give loans to or from audit clients because, again, that gives a beneficial interest. If you owe money to a client, you wouldn't want to accept the clients in case they call the loan in quickly and see if the client owes <coughs> oh, you money. Again, you want to be careful to make sure they don't default on the loan. And that could also include, for example, overdue audit fees. If the client hasn't paid you recently, that can be construed as a loan to a client because effectively you're, um, you're letting them have money for longer than they should do. In that situation, you would normally not start the next audit until the client has paid that fee, paid the outstanding balance. Otherwise, it is a loan to a client and you would be on the audit. You might be careful to not to upset the client as in perhaps not modify the audit report for fear that the default on the loan. There's also the issue of goods and services in hospitality, which could be construed, of course, as a bribe. If the client tries to give you other goods or services over and above the audit fee, it looks like you're trying to get something else for doing the audit. Um, for example, the client might say, oh, for a few good meals or something. In F8, we also have strange things like of balloon flights taking place as a thank you for doing the audit. And of course, the basic rule is here, don't accept those unless the value we could say is negligible because it means otherwise your independence is impaired. You're trying to do the audit and do a good audit on the assumption that you're going to get something else at the end of it to say a, a good meal or whatever else it is. Uh, so value is negligible. Technically, it's also what client staff would get. The same sort of uh, discount perhaps in a client shop would normally be OK. Or the audit firms will have their own guidance set out as to what hospitality can be accepted. And audit staff would be expected to follow that. Uh, provision of other services to audit clients it depends on the jurisdiction. In some situations, those are now banned, like in America, in England, you could probably give taxation services, but other things may actually have to be agreed by different bidders at the clients. Um, the overall idea is, though, that, that where they are allowed, still you must be careful not to perform management functions. In other words, to take management decisions for the clients. So yes, you can give advice to clients but must make sure the client understands your advice and the client at the end of the day is going to make the decision on what to do with that advice. So just to be clear, it depends on the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions will say, sorry, no other services to maintain complete independence of audit clients. Others will allow to some services, others allow more. But all the time, always make sure the client is taking the decision. Is only advice is being given so you're not performing management functions. Uh, the client, of course, may try and sue you. Actual threat and litigation, which will certainly impair objectivity. Uh, so therefore, you may actually have to resign if, if the client if it gets to that sort of nasty situation. It's an intimidation threat, obviously. The client is trying to get you to do something, they actually take you to court because they're not happy with the service or whatever. Straight away, the objective is activity is threatened. And in most situations, that would simply mean that the audit firm is going to literally resign because there's no other way to get around that threat. Similarly, specialized valuations. If the client wants you to value something that's going to go on to the statement of financial position particularly, and then, of course, the auditor is going to audit that straight away. There is a self-review threat. So that's not going to be allowed. OK, this is the so in other words, they're allowed, but they must not obtain the object objectivity of the audit. Now, if you're actually going to value something and then audit it, your objectivity is straight away impaired. And that means you can't do the valuation. If it's not part, not going to be audited later, whatever that might be, you'd be OK. But otherwise, look for objectivity. If that is threatened, then the valuation cannot be performed. <clears throat> There's also a slight issue there of second and other opinions. Um, well, 
most audit firms don't go and second guess or give second opinions. It is in technically possible, but you wouldn't have the audit um, evidence to actually make that opinion. So if there is actually a major dispute, the only thing to do would be to contact a primary auditor, get the information, and then you can make, make your own mind up, make your own opinion. But most of the time, again, that is not going to be allowed. The, the second the second auditor couldn't get the information and therefore would not be able to basically give another opinion. Okay. But those are just a few of the areas that you might hit within P7. The examiner can get quite creative in this area, as we'll see in looking at some exam questions. So I don't just take that as the, the exhaustive list. It's not. It's just reminding you a few situations where there will be ethical threats and a little bit of an idea about what to do with those. Now, let's just have a look at a couple of very short questions here, just to remind ourselves, again, as some of the very basic ethical principles. Uh, here's one. Um, ABC, as I said before, firms are tender for the audit. One of XYZ's partners, that's the audit firm, um, <coughs> Mr A's son, who is 19 hold shares in ABC, can XYZ tender for the audit? Well, um, there is an issue there, of course, that, all right, um, <coughs> partner uh, may be deemed to be connected to um, the children. However, this is, oops, is minor children. So certainly in the UK, the major majority is 18. So as the son is 19, so effectively no longer a child, then um, the firm can bid. Or can tender for the audit. Okay, the, 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 the child there is deemed to be acting on their own, but not known to the parents anymore, and therefore the tender is okay. You probably want to make sure if that goes ahead that um, that, that uh, partner is actually not involved in the audit, or the son doesn't repair anything is going to be audited. But that's a different question than whether you can, can tender. The quick answer is there, yes you can. Similarly, if you go into section uh, question 2.2, ABC Limited has asked XYZ audit firm to tender for the audit again. One of XYZ's partners, Mr. A, holds shares in ABC. Can XYZ tender for the audit? Even though Mr. A will not be involved in the audit, the quick answer, of course, is no. They can't tender for the audit. Because all audit partners must be independent of all audit clients. The only possibility there is for a, Mr. A to sell shares in uh, ABC Limited prior to tendering. So <clears throat> um, we then show independence from the audit firm to that particular potential client. But otherwise, no, the tender wouldn't be allowed because Mr. A holds these shares. Now, if in question 2.3, how the situation changed if Mr. A was the audit manager in XYZ, um, right, then you, you may think this is not so bad, but it's not. Um, it's all about tender or do the audit if the manager holds shares in the client. Remember that their, their, their independence is still impaired now because they've got shares they want to get dividend. So they might, they might produce an incorrect report or they might overlook things that increase profit, for example, because they want more dividend. Right? So you can't actually turn up the audit. Okay, so the answer to that particular problem You'd have to remove Mr. A from <clears throat> that client. 
to show independence. And to be clear at this stage, most audit firms require all audit staff not to hold shares in any client. Again, because that shows complete independence. Technically, technically you could hold the shares if, if the audit manager is not actually the audit manager on that client. But <clears throat> to show independence, most firms would say, no, that's not allowed. And, we'll, and have every year their clients or their audit staff sign up and say, we don't hold shares in any of these companies. It does show complete independence. So that's just a, a few situations of independence again, and we're starting to get to some very outline answers there. That's not enough for the ex exam standard yet, <clears throat> but starts to get the idea of the thought processes we're going to need to actually produce exam standard answers. Just a bit more background, a few more things to remind you of. Let me get to the right bit of the documents. There we go. Professional duty of confidentiality. Remember, you can't disclose client information to, <clears throat> to to third parties. There's only some. There's a very few situations where you might be able to do that. Like, for example, the client agrees, or you think it's your public duty, or in the public interest, to do that. Sorry, I'll move the page again. I was going to put interest there as well. So. Uh, that would then be allowable or the special right or due to the disclose because what the the firm would say is basically all the court might say is please give us some information or do you want to say to the court look this is incorrect and what we will do is we give the information to the court to back up our own to actually clear our name so that's when you could disclose there are also situations also situations where you must disclose and they relate to things like court orders or your clients involved in terrorism or money laundering <clears throat> or drug trafficking and there might be other situations perhaps your clients acting recklessly very specific laws where you've got to actually disclose those I shouldn't worry about specifically the one that normally comes up in the exam is money laundering <clears throat> And it's deciding what to do in that situation and we'll hit money and order a couple of times during, throughout this session so most of the time you can only disclose your client agrees or you think, think it's in the public interest or the client is breaking some law and the money laundering laws being the, the most important one nowadays and we need to disclose if we think the client is involved in money laundering <clears throat> remember the small point there with confidential as well about your working papers an account has a lien over the working papers going to the client where bills are in play relating to those working papers so you've got a little bit of leverage there should you want to try to get the client to, to pay up if you've got working papers or the client so you can prove that as part of the audit then you might be able to get the client to pay before you get the working papers back but that's a fairly minor point again and actually it's not been examined as far as I remember in P7 for, for ages. But anyway, just a reminder anyway. Right. <clears throat> <coughs> Little question. Uh, a, B, X, Y, Z obviously has been appointed. They're doing the audit of ABC Limited. And they've identified some unusual transactions in the books of ABC. ABC appears to transfer money between three different bank accounts without any commercial reason for doing this. What action should they take? Well, that, that straight away is uh, a sign of money laundering, as in you're transferring money for no commercial reason between different banks. So the actions to take will include surprisingly this one first. Along, if you haven't actually done anything else, you'd actually ask the client. Because there might be a, there might be a good reason that simply you don't know, <clears throat> and I know we're not supposed to tip clients off that we're thinking about money laundering, but there again, if you don't ask the clients about something you found, they could be tipped off the other way. 
they help the auditor has actually um, identified something strange and asked us about it and the client may want to know why that is or might think you're suspicious and therefore they, they the client is thinking you know about any money laundering so the first thing to do is actually ask the client come on you know what's going on here you can then <coughs> Well, you can see the anarchy of the answers. If you think they're okay, fine. Otherwise, you, what you want to do is actually then to involve the money laundering reporting officer in the audit firm. The reporting process won't be for the the senior or the manager or the partner on that audit to make any reports. They have to report to their own MRO first, who will then consider the evidence <coughs> and then whether to report to the relevant authorities. And it's up to them Well, well, sorry, if necessary, makes the report. In, in, in the UK, that's called a suspicious activity, activity report in SAR. It doesn't matter which jurisdiction you're in, it just basically makes the report to the authorities if they think that's necessary. But the point is there, don't just jump to the conclusion a client is doing something wrong. Uh, they may not be, although it does look unusual, it is appropriate first to check with the client what's going on before involving the MLRO and before certainly doing any report on that. <clears throat> oh, remember, by the way, professional appointment, the nomination there, the six letters kicking around, they might just be examined at uh, P7, at least not the letters, but the uptake of something going wrong within that system. So in order to clients, permission to contact the old auditor, the client gives permission, in order to contact the old auditor on their own professional reasons why we should not accept nomination. Um, the old auditor asks permission of the client to contact the new auditor. The client gives the permission. And then finally, the old auditor can contact the new auditor with any professional reasons. Or that there aren't any, because most of the time, I imagine there won't be. But uh, you have to go through that process, professional etiquette, just to make sure that uh, the, non the, the change order is taking place um, correctly. If at any, the process fails at any stage, uh, we don't normally accept appointments. The, 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 the etiquette there is, is important. If it does fail, all right, normally not accept, but it doesn't preclude the new auditor from taking on that appointment. So it's not stopped, but the new auditor will be under, uh, I, I think, um, Bit more skepticism there as to what was going on that may decide not to accept appointment but say it doesn't preclude them from accepting appointments and of course when accepting appointment you'd also be talking about fees in fact we talked about fees um, in the last session that's just a reminder that any fee you're going to make them when you get it when you actually accept the audit is based on time and skill of the staff you will agree with the with the, with the clients hopefully for starting work and don't forget at low fees may constitute low balling OK, so you're trying to, to bid low for the audit and it might mean actually you're going to get you're expecting higher fees from other work or recouping those other fit the, the low fees in the future by raising the audit fee. It doesn't matter. Just be careful there that the fee you can show does cover the quality of work that you need to do. So a little question here. XYZ has successfully completed professional clearance the order of ABC. The ABC stores owes the old auditor fees. Will this prevent XYZ from accepting nomination? The quick answer, of course, is uh, no. You could still accept, but do you want to? So just because that just because there is a, an issue there, the auditor it does, the auditor doesn't mean you can't accept. But I don't think you actually want to accept because there's a risk there.
So I say very, very unlikely to accept. There we are. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't actually stop. But I don't think you'd actually want to do that. Bit of board information there. A bit about financial advice given to clients. We've already said that you can give other advice to clients. Just make sure, please, that you're not taking management decisions. <clears throat> uh, again, be careful also, and a typical scenario of MP7, might have met it a little bit in FA, but say of MP7, you're suddenly having to advise two clients, and that might well be in a takeover bid, for example, the both try to take over the same third party. Due to that, you're then getting some very price-sensitive information. It'd be very difficult not to share that between different clients. And therefore, the normal action in that situation is only to work for one party, not both. Or in fact, neither, if you can't decide who you shouldn't work for. So avoid a conflict of interest, potential breach of confidentiality in that situation. Only work for one client, not two, or in fact, neither of them. Other things that will help you avoid conflicts of interest. Um, don't forget there are various safeguards. Uh, those created by the profession. So you need training in CPD, so you do know about potential conflicts. There's also those within the entity, that's the audit firm, making sure they've got, uh, you've got good staff, you have good training for staff, staff are given the right sort of level of work and so on and work is reviewed and within the reporting accounting itself there's still quality procedures going on so there's still training and so on and the reporting accountant make sure they get the appropriate training make sure they're making the right quality decision on audits so you've got those three areas of safeguards there will be examined specifically within a question but you might have to say or try and explain what to do with the situation and you might want to mention the safeguards at that stage so pure theory won't be examined, but the detail of the safeguards might be. Um, we're not going to much on fraud and error, but just again a quick reminder. Auditors, I'm trying to make sure that uh, financial statements do show a true and fair view, that there are no material errors, and those errors may be caused by fraud or error, and fraud is deception, and error is an unintentional mistake or misapplication of accounting policies. It doesn't matter. Auditors are still looking for both of those. Of course, if it is fraud, we're straight away thinking about money laundering. So just uh, again, beware that money laundering keeps in many questions. The examiner very rarely says it's money laundering. You have to identify that and then do something about it. If you think about disclosure to authorities, money laundering, of course, is simply suspicion of laundering. Otherwise, you start to think of other things as well. If it's not money laundering, when to disclose. And it might be the public has been affected, therefore it's in the public interest. It may be a particularly serious matter. Uh, there might be lots of, a lot of money or other factors involved. You're thinking about what the, why the client doesn't want to disclose. That might be a reason for disclosure. The client is uncomfortable. They've broken some regulation. You need to take that to the authorities. And the, whether the clients can repeat these acts. Again, if it's a one-off, it was a mis an, an unintentional misapplication, an error, you might be okay. But if not, again, you think about when to disclose. But to be clear, uh, if you have suspicion of money laundering, you must disclose anyway. It's other matters outside of that, perhaps other rules or laws. You're not auditing with the client. Perhaps environmental law, for example, and there's no specific requirement for auditors to disclose, those factors will then weigh in to help you make the decision about whether to tell somebody, tell the authorities. <clears throat> Breach of law regulation, just to back that up, it's management that have to follow all the laws and regulations. The auditor simply bases their work on standard legal framework effect in the entity, which is basically the financial accounting system and laws. All right. Audit set designed to detect material non-compliance very relevant statute legislation because they will affect the accounts in that sense. All right. And that's what we're looking for. We don't have to have detailed knowledge of all law and regulation, but if there is a material error in the accounts, 
then we'll do something about it. And that's what we have to be concerned about. Other legislation has been breached. We may well ask management about that. We may think about disclosure, but it's on this little list of things up here above this heading that we're going to think about when to disclose. And again, management will have to collaborate what we found, particularly if we're not disclosing. But I'll have to just talk about why they're not doing that. So to be clear, we need to know about as auditors the law and regulation regarding the accounts. We'll have secondary knowledge about other regulation as well, but it's only where the accounts don't show a true and fair view. There's a material error in them. We need to do something about it. Otherwise, we think about the list up here, the five things here about whether to disclose or not. So if you find transactions appear to have breached a relevant statute, OK, what are you going to do? The answer is straight away. <coughs> Quite the directors, OK, so what statute is broken and what are they going to do about it? Hopefully the directors are going to do something about that. OK, if it's money laundering, um, disclose. Anti-money laundering legislation, so that's disclose. Other legislation, that's where you need to consider disclosure. All right. And that's the public interest and some of the list we just had above. Other little bit about ethics is actually the, the expectation gap. <coughs> Excuse me where people think that accountants do different things than what we actually do do, like as, as, a, as a, a auditors and accountants. There's a standards gap, do you know what the auditing standards are and perceived to be, as in we actually don't audit everything. The auditing standards don't say that, public might think we do. There's a performance gap, that auditors are deemed to actually find every single little thing that's wrong. Um, we don't because, again, we don't audit everything. And the public doesn't know what the auditors are actually legally responsible to. It's only the shareholders that occasion the public might think responsible to them. And of course, um, we're not. So how to try and close that gap, we actually have to tell them what the audit is. We have to explain that we're not going to find all fraud. It's only material fraud and basically the control of the auditing profession, whether it's a quality control which we have, and we have various standards on quality control which we follow. And therefore, the public might recognise, might recognise we're doing work to the right standard. Again, it's actually advertising that, what standards we do follow. Just a little bit there, expectation gap. Uh, you sometimes get a little discursive question on these sort of things. So a little bit of background knowledge is occasionally helpful. Anyway, there we are. that's just a, a summary of some of the ethical bits. Um, let's move on. I'm just going to copy that now. And we're going to get, hopefully, how to answer ethics questions. Um, the quick answer is, Try and identify the issue from the scenario. And, and if you literally state what that is, you can then say why well, that's ethical. What you might want to do, um, mention the specific you know, threat, like say self-interest, and discuss that. And then normally now, we're going to have to try to explain how to overcome that particular threat. And there may be possibilities there, right? This may not be clear cut. And you might also be needed to do a conclusion, especially where threat cannot be removed. So the, the, the threat cannot be reduced to an acceptable level, then the auditor will certainly have to resign or something similar. And the examiner is also looking right down there to, that, to, to know if you know when you actually have to resign, if you like. Right, let's just have a look at a couple of questions on that. Don't want any of those. I think I want that one. Is 
this is your IPC notes, and there's a question on ethics here from June 2008. It's called Smith & Co. And you do get these quite long questions occasionally from the examiner. But the, the rubric is always the same. Identify and discuss the ethical and other professional issues raised by whatever it is and recommend action you should take in respect of those. And there are three separate situations there of Norman, Wallace and Software su Supply Company. So it's the ethical and other professional issues. It's telling you right, that something is wrong. Ethics may well be breached, and we need to do something about that. We won't do all this once we have a look at the beginning of it just to see what's going on. All right. So the audit manager of Smith & Co., a firm of certified, charter certified accountants, recently made response for reviewing invoices based to clients and for monitoring of clients' con control procedures. Several matters have come to light during the most, most recent review. So the audit manager really invoice goes to clients once your first credit control procedures. It looks like it's an internal situation. Norman & Co., a large private company, has not paid an invoice from Smith & Co. dated the 5th of June 2007, working with a certain phone statement audit for the end of the 20th of February. Yes, yeah, so it's actually our internal processes here inside the firm, which is an unusual question, but it's possible. So this company is now overdue on invoice for February, March, April, May. Going to March, yeah, March, April, May, going to June. So it's over three months old. A far note dated 3rd of December 27, <coughs> excuse me, states Norman Co. saying poor cash flows and can't pay the balance. Oh no, it's even the old that, isn't it? It's June to November. It's about six months old. Good grief. Right, so it's a long way old. This is the only piece of information in the file you're reviewing related to this invoice. Be aware that the final audit for the year 21st issue had not been invoiced is nearly complete and the audit report is due to be issued immediately. All right, so they're, they actually haven't paid their bill from last year and you're doing this year's audit. Ouch. Now that, that's a bad situation. It's certainly a, a, an ethical breach within the firm itself, as well as poor cash management, obviously. So if you follow our system through, you know, uh, what's the issue? I can't think of a previous BIOS audit. looks like over a year overdue. Right, this constitutes a loan to the client. So now we can talk about it and with your self-interest threat to the audit firm. Try and explain that if we can, discuss it. Modify the audit report in case the client uh, defaults on the, the invoice. Right, so we know what the problem is, we've said something about it. And it's a client, not a bad client. Thank you, word. Right. So what what are, what are we going to do? Well, the firm should have refused to start work on the next year's audit. and wait for the debt to be paid, all right? Uh, this has not happened. So within, I've got the client, our 
with Smith and Co. Technical training may be needed for the partner manager who made the decision to start the next year's audit. Ethical training is actually quite a good thing to make, point to make. All right, so that's a possibility. Now, so as the audit is nearly complete, the client must be informed of the situation and all work stopped. Okay, that's the normal thing you would do. So tell the client, sorry, we're not going to finish the audit. We can't do the report until you pay for last year. Not this year, but last year. All right. Um, and that's almost the conclusion. There's not a lot more we could say there. It's not a threat because you can't remove the threat otherwise. The client refuses to pay, then then Smith and Co may need to consider resignation rather <coughs> than continue supporting the client in money terms and issuing the next audit report. And that will certainly put a marker down for anybody else that wants to do the audit that there are problems because we've had to make a notice on resignation there as to why we've resigned. But we're trying to follow this, this system through, all right, saying what the issue is. So there's the, if you like, there's the issue. We're trying to say why it's ethical. And if you do want to say it's a self-interest threat or something, that's absolutely fine. So mention the sort of threat it is. All right. We are trying to look for the, the options, so what to do. And we are trying to get to some form of conclusion. There we are. So we're telling, we're telling the, the firm what to do. We're telling the examiner of the situation. We understand the problem and what has got to happen now. Well, that's quite an interesting question because that is based internally in a firm of accountants or firm of auditors. You don't normally get that. Okay, to be fair, this was June 2008. One of those could come up again. But the other sort of question you get in ethics actually relates to the firm and relating external to the firm. Uh, and I've got the wrong section there, I think. No, I don't want that one at all. Apologies, is this the right one? No, I don't want that one. And all these nicely prepared and I've now gone and got the wrong example. Okay, let's go back to my Word document. My Word document tells me it's December 13, question 4. So let's get December 13. December 13, there we go. I'm in the wrong part of the paper, that's why. So here's the December 13 paper from P7. If we jump down to question 4, we start to see the detail that the examiner does on a more recent question. Exactly the same requirement, identify and discuss the ethical or other professional issues raised and recommend actions you be taken in respect of. So we've still got exactly the same format. All right, let's go back to our Word document. Go back to the end of the Word document. There's our approach to ethics and we've got to do these four things. So this is the December 13, question 
4. We still got to those four things. There's the requirement. Identify and discuss the ethical or the professional issues raised. So identify the issue, discuss it, and recommend any actions that should be taken in respect of. So what to do, options, recommend any actions, and if necessary, give a conclusion. All right. Particularly where we can't reduce those, those threats to an acceptable level. So let's look at one of those now. Um, okay, let's take the middle one. It's only it's six marks, but I'm sure we can get those. Um, by the way, um, the beginning, your, your audit manager in Chester and Co. and you're reviewing three situations recent arisen with potential potential additional audit clients of your firm. Right. So this is the no more normal question we get nowadays. It's not just the internal question of the audit f firm. It's actually relating to the audit clients. And that's what I'm going to look at, number two there, which is Stratford Co. Um, the audit of Stratford Co's financial statements here in 2013 will commence shortly. Okay. The company has since financial difficulties. Stratford Co's main director, Colin Charlegut, has requested the audit engagement partner accompanies him to a meeting with the bank where a new loan will be discussed and the draft financial statements reviewed. All right, so there's, it looks like uh, an advocacy threat. We're going to support the client. So there's threat number one. Colin has hinted that if the partner does not accompany him to the meeting, he'll put the audit out to tender. There's also an intimidation threat. If you don't do this, you might lose the audit. In addition, the invoice range of the interim audit work for has not yet been paid. Oh, good grief. So we've also got threat number three there, the normal one we've seen already in the last example, where the client's not paid, and therefore there's a self-interest threat, the loan being made to the client. Although it's only the interim audit, so we might just about get away with that one. It's certainly not last year's audit, it's just this year's. But there are three situations. So let's, let's just start down the road with this one then. So can we go to the meeting with the client? What's the issue? Uh, the client is Stratford. If I could spell. Request of the audit, the partner from of um, Chester and Co. Okay, so that, there's the issue. Stratford requests the audit partner from Chester Co. to attend the meeting about the loan plans will be discussed. Okay, why is that ethical? It's an advocacy threat because it may appear that Chester is supporting their clients, clients' request for funds and also effectively Gowran seeing that financial information is correct. Although I don't think there's anything in the scenario there that says we're going to no draft our stage will be reviewed. Okay. We did actually say we finished the audit, we haven't finished the audit of course, so yeah. Okay, so this is Not correct, as the audit is not complete. Right, so what to do? Options. Um, to remove the threat, <coughs> let's explain to Chester. Sorry, um, Stratford. Places. Chester and Stratford, by the way, are two cities in England. 
which makes this slightly confusing because you think about which city it is. Right, then to Stratford. Anything else we could do? Might be able to do that again. The threat uh, must be um, considered. Okay, that's the efficacy threat must be considered. So if you want to put efficacy there again, advocacy. If the threat is still significant, then no other option can be offered to the client. So there we are. We've identified the issue, we've said what the threat is, and we've discussed it, and we try to explain actions, two of them there, <coughs> excuse me, to actually um, help the client. I mean, to be fair, for the mark point of view, we're probably picking up about 0.5 there, sorry, 0.5. So identifying something is not always too onerous. We're certainly going to get a mark there for mentioning the advocacy threats. Right, we're certainly going to get a mark for discussing in this situation the possibilities. And there is certainly, again, perhaps at the half there for getting the conclusion sorted. So that, there's the first part. And if we want to actually put a heading as well, um, and underline that. Now the marker is completely clear about what we're trying to do. How's that? All right. So there, there's a fairly succinct but hopefully quite high mark earning answer. But don't forget we've only got three marks so far. There are six to get. So the second thing we've identified, Connor's hinted that a partner's not coming to the meeting, he'll put the audit out to tender. Okay. So the second thing here is now Intimidation threat. Now we can start to run these together, we're running out a little bit of a time. So, um, to me dation threats. All right. <clears throat> the client is explain that attempting to influence influence the audit firm. By some threat. In this case, uh, losing potentially losing the audit. So we've actually said what the threat is there, identified the issue, sorry, and said what the threat is all in one go. Makes things just a little bit quicker, we'll certainly get a mark for that. Um, so what are we going to do? It's not, it's not wrong to say or difficult for Shasta uh, to limit this threat as the audit firm cannot stop the client <coughs> putting the audit out to tender. All right, so the so we've got more, more comment there. We know it's not an easy situation to get around. So what are we going to do? We must meet now, who has actually made the threats? Colin, who's Colin? Colin, where are you? Managing director. Hmm. 
then you'll, the manager has made the all first position. We can say something like this. knowledge of uh, Stratford, isn't it, again? And if I were to assist with financial difficulties. But we're still going to give a conclusion. There is a, there is a potential action there you've got to meet. You have actually tried to say, say to the MD, hey, look, this is not a very good idea, but if necessary, we're still going to have to ignore that. Um, <clears throat> here's the audit firm. We we'll have to accept um, the client's decision. They cannot be pressurized. into meeting with the bank. So that is actually give our conclusion that it's not necessarily satisfactory, but that is what we may have to do. So again, we've identified the threat, training as the audit firm, essentially using the audit. So we certainly ought to get at least half a mark for that one. <clears throat> it's difficult to limit this threat firm because I stopped the client putting the audit out of the tender, might get another half, but then there's a quite a a nice bulky bit here is what you've got to do and trying to say why you might want to keep the audit. So we've got at least another mark there. But there's also a very good conclusion. Now, depending on how the, the marking scheme has gone, that might be 1.5 or it might even be a mark because it recognises that you can't actually frame intimidation threats. It's very, very difficult to get rid of them. But there we are. So the format of the didn't want that. It's out of the way. Thank you. Right. Formative of the answer is always, always like this. Try and identify the issue. Do say why it's ethical. You can mention the sort of threat it is. Try and give some options. They're the actions. And try and give a conclusion. Even if the conclusion is um, you can't really well, you can't do anything, or you may have to be kicked it off the audit effectively, then that's the conclusion. And you've got to mention that. And that's the way those questions are going to go. There are other examples there, Tetbury and Banbury. You should have a look at that paper is available December 13 off the ACCA website. That's perhaps where we go to try to even get into this idea of identifying the threats, saying what's ethical, stating the options, and then giving a conclusion about what to do. So that's getting all the end of the session on ethics. We've had a quick revision of some of the ethical principles there, just to remind you of them. We've, uh, we've identified the approach to ethical questions, the issue, why is it ethical, what to do, there may be options. And remember, if you can give a conclusion, and we looked at two questions there, one for the APC pack, one from off the ACCA website to give us ideas about how to answer questions. Uh, you see me do a couple of those, so as you get time, it's worth having a go. A few other questions to try and follow that same idea. Fairly short questions, sorry, fairly short answers. I'll go back to my answers, there they are. Relatively short, but also breaking them down so it's easy for the marker to get into. Give a heading, short sentences and paragraphs makes it very, very easy to mark. Don't put them into one big paragraph, please, just in case the marker misses something. Break them down. There's the issue. Let's talk about it. Let's try and give some actions and a conclusion and that will get you lots of marks. So there we are, that finished ethics. I look forward to seeing you for session three, where we start to look at audit planning. This is Alan signing off for now. Thank you for listening. Cheerio. APC, accounting for your future.